All right, so now that we know this good logarithm problem, we can explain what a digital signature algorithm is. After the digital signature algorithm, we will talk about elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, but both of them, you know, just analogous. In one case, you use ZP, in the other one, you use an elliptic curve. So it is a good idea to first understand what the digital signature algorithm is, because that way we will be, uh, we will be better to understand how the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm works. So let's define what the digital signature is. A digital signature is a number dependent on some secret known only to the signer, the signer's private key, and additionally on the contents of the message being signed. Due to the sizes of the signatures, hash of the message is signed instead of the message itself. Signatures must be verifiable. In other words, if a dispute arises as to whether an identity signed a document, an unbiased third party should be able to resolve the matter equitably without requiring access to the signer's private key. So this is actually what happens. Somebody in a Bitcoin transaction, for instance, you sign your transaction and every other node can verify that you really signed it. So there no, there's no dispute if, you know, if the digital signature algorithm is correct. So disputes, uh, disputes may arise when a signer tries to repudiate a signature it did create. So I sign a Bitcoin transaction, then I claim that I didn't sign. So a dispute might arise. Or when a forger makes a fraudulent claim. Right? So in this case, you try to you know, forge a signature which is not signed by the actually the person who can sign it. Digital signature schemes can be used to provide the following basic cryptographic services, data integrity, the assurance that data has not been altered by unauthorized or unknown means, data origin authentication, the assurance that the source of data is as claimed, non-repudiation, the assurance that an entity cannot deny previous actions or commitments. So this is actually what we use in you know, blockchains or cryptocurrencies because um, and somebody makes a transaction, they sign it, so this way they cannot then repudiate it later. But yes, a, a warning that I made before, a digital signature algorithm is not an encryption algorithm, okay? This is important because here you are not trying to provide a confidentiality. So when you sign a message, actually you don't sign the message itself, you sign the hash of it, right? Then when you say that you signed it, you actually provide the message itself, so it is not a secret. In the encryption, I'm trying to hide the message itself. Here, I'm not trying to hide the message. I'm showing that I signed it, okay? This is important. This is why almost every uh, YouTube video is wrong about this concept because they say that, you know, Bitcoin uses encryption or something. Even ChatGPT thinks that you use an encryption, but it is not. Hash functions, digital signatures are not encryption algorithms, okay? Digital signature schemes are commonly used as primitives in cryptographic protocols that provide other services, including entity authentication. There are many standards for that. Authenticated key transport, again, many uh, standards. Some of them are very old. Some of them are revised recently. And authenticated key agreements, again, there are many standards about this. So you can use digital signatures for many different purposes. The uh, basic and most used one, but nowadays we are trying to get rid of it. The algorithm is called digital signature algorithm or digital signature standard. So this was proposed in August 1991 by the United States National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. It was specified in a, a US government federal information processing standard, FIPS, called the digital signature standard. The DSA can be viewed as a variant of the Algama signature scheme. Actually, this is why I showed you how Algama works in the previous slides. Its security is based on the interactability of the discrete logarithm problem in prime order subgroups of ZP star. So here you are using this field, but you are also working on the subgroup, okay? By subgroup, we mean that generated generates a subgroup of this field. This is important because uh, the discrete logarithm problem applies to both of these uh, both this group and this subgroup. Okay, I will talk about it when I talk about security. So this sentence from last year, I will also update it in the following slide, but I deliberately not deleted it because in the last year I said that, you know, this starting to think that to remove DSA. So in the draft version last year, in the FIPS 186-5, they state the following, 
prior versions of this standard specified the DSA. This standard no longer approves DSA for digital signature generation. DSA may be used to verify signatures generated prior to the implementation date of the standard. See the previous version for the specifications of DSA. Okay, so when I was teaching last year, NIST was trying to move on from this version to this version. So last year, DSA was a standard, but they said that in the next version of this document, they will remove DSA and only allow to verification of previously signed signatures. So just one month ago, in February 2023, they announced the final version of this FIPS document. So the latest version of FIPS 186-5 removed DSA, DSS, and it can only be used to verify signatures signed before this update. NIST also edit this comment, so I give it as a quotation. Furthermore, NIST proposed the removal of DSA from the FIPS as an approved method for generating digital signatures because of limited use by industry and academic analysis finding that implementations of DSA may be vulnerable to attacks. Okay. This is why you should avoid DSA and move on to elliptic curve digital signature algorithm instead. Again, to understand elliptic curve digital signatures, let's look at DSA itself because you know here we are working with numbers, so it is easier to visualize in the elliptic curve version. We are going to talk about points on the elliptic curve. So DSA is very simple. First, you start with parameter generation. So you choose a good hash function like SHA-2 or SHA-3. You choose key lengths L and N, like 3072 and 256. You can see that these numbers I already mentioned when I was talking about security. So this actually provides you 128-bit security. This is why if you reduce it to you know this one to 2048, I guess, right? Uh, this would mean that uh, you will have a 112 bit security. So, this is why this is the uh, smallest security or key length sizes that we allow for DSA nowadays. So, for these numbers, so if you choose n equals to 256, then you choose an 256 bit prime Q. Then you choose a, you know, 300 and 72 bit prime modulus p such that p minus 1 is a multiple of q so in the parameter generation you have to follow these steps then you choose g its multiplicative group order modulo p must be q so this is why you cannot choose every g right so this is the generation part so first you can generate these parameters p q and g and you can share this between different users of the system. For instance, if we were, you, if Bitcoin used this algorithm, what it was going to do was to choose this P, Q, and G and put it inside the software, and everybody else would be using these parameters. Okay. Instead, it uses elliptic curve digital signatures. So instead of these parameters, we will use elliptic curve parameters there. But you can simply choose this one and use it for everybody. Or, for instance, you want to communicate to 10 people in your life. For each of these 10 people, you can generate different P, Q, and G. Okay, choice is yours. But of course, sticking to uh, one uh, parameter and standardizing it makes things easier. Okay, now you created the parameters. Next step is that as a user, you have to you know, create your private and public key. So in the cryptocurrency world, this is what you do with your wallet, right? You create an address. So again, if it were uh, DSA, this is what you would you would do. You would randomly choose a secret key X, where X is a number between zero and Q. Recall that Q is a 256-bit prime if you choose it like this. Then you calculate the public key, which is X power of G modulo P. So it is Y. As you can see, this is very similar to Algama. So again, if this were, if you want to use this algorithm in your uh, cryptocurrency, this Y would be your wallet address. Of course, in practice, this would be large, so you would hash it and so on and so forth to make it smaller. Okay, how the signing works now? Works now. So assume that we generated the parameters for everybody, then every user generated their own private and public keys. Now, how you sign a message? You sign it as follows. You randomly choose a K per message. So whenever you sign something, you randomly choose this number and you have to be sure that you're always using a different number. If you use the same random number twice, 
sign two different transactions, your secret key is lost. People can easily get it. So this is actually what happened years ago. Uh, in elliptic curve digital signature, of course, somebody made a transaction, like sending one Bitcoin to his friend, then sent a, two weeks later, made another transaction, but due to a bug in their software, they used the same key. So 10 minutes later, all of his Bitcoin were withdrawn, withdrawn from his account. So you have to be careful. So since the software does it in the background, you have to check your software if it works properly. In that scenario, there was a bug in the Java version of the Android application. Okay. So I focused a lot here because this is very important. You have to randomly choose a K and this should be kept secret. After you, this, you wouldn't use it again, okay? So to sign a message, you choose a random number K. So then you calculate the K power of G, okay? So, so you obtain a value R. Then M is the message you want to sign. You take the hash of the message, add to it X times R. R is just the value you calculated here. X is your secret message, okay? And you multiply it with K inverse. So this K actually comes into play here. Okay. So you calculated S and this is your signature. So this is how a signature works. You R and S are your signature. You give it them. Of course, when somebody wants to verify it, they have to know the message is out. This is why I'm telling that this is not encryption. The message is not secret. You're saying that I signed this. So in Bitcoin, the transaction is the thing you sign. So you write that transaction on the blockchain anyway. So it is not a secret. Okay, so when somebody wants to verify, what they do is as follows. They get the S from your signature and calculate the inverse of it. Again, you can use extended Euclidean algorithm and say that this is W. Then take the message. Again, in Bitcoin, this would be your transaction. Take the hash of it, multiply it with W. Say that this value is U1. Multiply R, which you again take it from the signature with W you calculated here multiply them and obtain u2 then say that okay i calculate v which is g to the power u1 y to the power u2 of course there are all of these in modular arithmetic then you check if this value v obtained equals to r if it is you say that the signature is valid if it is not you say that it is not valid here the proof is actually very similar to algorithm you can you know trace all of these steps back for instance, here you are uh, calculating the you know, U2 power of Y, right? But you have to go back and check what was the Y. Y actually is the public key, which is actually G to the X, where you don't know the X, right? So if you write all of these values here, okay, then you will realize that if the signature is correct, V should be equivalent to R. Okay? The idea is as simple as that. I mean, it is from actually basic number, elementary number theory. So, but good thing is that you sign something here, you provide the signature. It is small because you are hashing the message. For instance, NVIDIA creates a driver, graphics driver. It can be 1.5 gigabytes nowadays. So an operating system, if tries to sign it, here, just remove this hash here, you know, the M will be really right, right? It will be very hard to sign such a big thing. This is why they take the hash of it. And this is what operating systems actually sign when they uh, sign a drive. Yep. And for this reason, your uh, hash function should be second period resistant, right? Because otherwise I can claim that they actually sign something else. This is why we actually seen hash functions again. If your hash function is not second period resistant, we can break the system, okay? We can forge uh, signatures or the, also repudiate the signatures be really signed, okay? This is why it is important. Okay, uh, I finalize it with the security. The security of this discrete, uh, digital signature algorithm relies on two different discrete logarithm problems. One of them is the discrete logarithm problem in ZP start. Recall that this is the actual the field we were working on. So there's an algorithm called number field C, and this is sub-exponential time algorithm. This is why I told you to choose P large, like 3072 bits, okay? And this uh, sub-exponential time algorithm, the complexity is given here. You know, there's a constant like this. So 
if you go back to our definition of you know exponential time sub exponential time you can see this and it will make sense that but important thing is that it's a sub exponential if there weren't such a sub exponential time algorithm we would e could easily say that you know you can choose p as small as 256 bits but now i we are saying that due to this algorithm you have to make it at least 3072 bits second discrete logarithm problem works to the base g in the subgroup of order q recall that in this field we chose a gen element generated and it generated a subgroup so if you work on the discrete logarithm problem on the subgroup then you know uh, as i already mentioned uh, the polish row algorithm runs with a complex of p over two times q in square root and in the big one notation this p and two actually is not important right because it is just a constant the important thing is that in the big one notation this is square root of q that square root actually forces us to double the uh, key like this is why i said that here you know the q if you want 128 bit security you should choose q as 256 bits 